you think you got the answer. So, yeah. Why are we adding B, 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 B at the, at the end of it? Because that is replacing the same frame pointer, which we uh, do not care about. Because we have to override the same frame pointer um, before we get to the return address, which is what we're really after. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just trying to remember the uh, what's the safe frame buffer again? <laughs> pointer. The safe frame pointer is um yeah, the safe frame pointer is basically used by the uh, the main function, what called you know mm -hmm. the function that we're overflowing, and it. EVP is used to um, reference your local variables and stuff like that. So whenever you call another function and have a new set of local variables, you have to save the uh, the previous save frame pointer. That way, when you return into that function again well, later on, you can uh, restore the frame pointer and keep on using those local variables. So it's just like processing information that you have to keep track of. So we're overwriting the frame pointer to the, the previous function then. Yes, exactly. But we don't really care what it is because um, it will not be used um, before we start executing our shell play. So it doesn't matter that it's for So do, why do we, I'm time. just trying to remember, why would we overwrite it then if we don't care? Because we, we get to it before we get to the return address, so we have to um, overwrite it on okay. our journey to the return address. Yep. All right. Um, what's the guess? Zero eight zero four eight two nine Bravo. No, and I know it's not even looking because it's not a stack address. So your address should definitely be on the stack, right? Because that's where your password buffer is. So your address should be something like OSBFF something something something. The process be to find like find out what the point that ESP would be after you had loaded all that stuff. Yeah, and you're in there. Dave? Yeah. Look like we're 5A0. 5A0. <coughs> yeah, 5A0. 5A0. Five okay, so um, let's see. Here's what I'm going to do to solve it. I'll show you guys how I would do about this. So first of all, I'm in the wrong directory because I'm in the Hello Shell code directory. And uh, I want to be in the same directory as my process, just to make things simple. So I'm going to copy my payload file into the directory where the uh, simple login program is. And I run simple login in the debugger. I'm going to find where that gets call is made instead of breakpoint for after it. That way I know my payload has entered into the process address space because this has already been called. And I'm going to scan the stack for my shell code just based on recognition because I have the bytes that was the minimized. So I know that the gets call happens in the authorized function and it looks like it happens right after gets is uh, authorized plus 32. So I know if I set a breakpoint here, I will um, be breaking in the program after that payload has entered in to the uh, process address space so I can you know, actually look for it. I'm going to run the program with my payload. That way I can look for my payload in the, uh, the process address space on the stack. I'm just going to use that x slash s command or x slash 20x. 20 is arbitrary. I'm just sort of randomly taking a number here. Um, starting at ESP. I'm using ESP as a reference point because I know ESP is pointing at the stack that my uh, my payload is somewhere on the stack because um, my payload is in a local variable and local variables are on the stack. So x slash 20x ESP. And um, that looks familiar, right? So what would you do? 5A0. How did you arrive at your answer? 
I actually set up a break point at the uh, think the return just to see what the stack looked like right before I left. I think. Okay. Yeah, it's possible something happens. So stuff got messed around instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it's probably a better strategy just to set the breakpoint for right after your payload comes into the process, just so things uh, you know, haven't had as much time to change. So, using this method, I can see that there was, oh, I'm sorry. if I, I used any one of these as my return address, I would be all good in the hood because it would execute these no ops, no ops, no ops, no ops, blah, 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 then hit the first part of my shell coach, and then everything would happen, uh, happen nicely. Uh, another handy way to look for your payload as well is the x slash i instruction, which will try to interpret data on the stack as instructions. That way, when you start seeing your shellcode instructions develop, it's kind of a little bit easier to recognize them unless you, have, you know, can recognize your shellcode just based on the byte data. So, for instance, so yeah, we get some crap in there just because it's trying to interpret, um, you know, legit stack data as uh, x86 instructions, which are bogus, obviously. But then eventually down here we get to our no ops. So if we're to point the return address to any one of these, um, it should work. So what I want you guys to do is to pick one of these return addresses, append it to your payload, and then try to um, try to use it in your payload file and see if it works. So while you guys are doing that, I'm going to. Um, do it up here on my own in the screen, but uh, don't look at the screen. I want you guys to try to do it independently as well. And you may or may not have success depending on which address that you choose. Theoretically, any one of these should work, but some of them might not. See, and I'll explain why later. I hadn't set that up yet. Okay. So uh, the last thing I wrote in my payload was the BBBB, so there's still room for return address. So you can see my payload file now is BBBB, is a safe rate pointer. Then this should be the return address, and this is BFFF573, which is this last no op that I see here. Right. What I was saying is, when you we're using that payload to figure out what the address would be, yeah. but should we put in four? Um. Yeah. Good point. Like some dummy bytes, just so we, the the offset is the same. In some First cases, that is a better method to do. That will never hurt you to do that. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't matter. In this case, it doesn't matter. But in some cases, it will be. Because sometimes the addresses will change a little bit depending on how big your payload is. So if you're trying to find your addresses based on this. 68 byte payload, and then go and finalize your payload to 72 bytes, then all your addresses are a little bit off. And your payload is crashing this stop because um, you base all your addresses off of a 68 byte payload, and things are a little bit different. This case, it doesn't But having all the no ops always does, right? Yes, yes, it does. What was that command that showed each instruction and its address? One of the top. Slash. 
Pin so I or 20 I that's so arbitrary number of copy instructions and then ESP. Dollar, so dollar zero is dependent on the. I broke an authorized specific ticket right after the GIFs call. So I knew that my payload would have already uh, entered into the stack at that point. If I had broken before that, my payload wouldn't have been on the stack because the GIFs call would have been made. The GIFs call would not have been made yet. The GIFs call is what's reading in our password attempt, which is where the payload is coming from. Technically, you could just um, root to ESP and then try to use like ESP plus some offset as your return address, but it helps to see the actual payload bytes when you're doing this. So it's about time for lunch. I'm curious if you guys would rather me show you what the next lab is going to be so you can think about it or work on it over the lunch break, or would you rather just have, you know, ignorant bliss about what the next uh, round of torture will be? Certainly up to you. Just let me know what you guys want. How long will it take? Um, I'm probably going to give you guys like 30 minutes to an hour on your own. I won't really be walking you through that one. Just try to get it. How long, how long will it take you to explain it? Five minutes. I know go ahead. Go ahead. OK. All right. Motivated. I like that. So. Uh, for those of you still working on the uh, the Hello World shellcode, getting it to work, yeah, that's okay. I just kind of for those of you already done and I want to think about this over lunch, I want to show you this lab. And the next lab is going to basically be developing real weaponized shellcode that we can use because uh, this Hello World example is obviously a toy example. So I want you guys to develop something a little bit more uh, realistic that you can use. And so the shellcode we're going to develop is going to spawn a shell, execve slash bin slash sh. That way, if um, you know, we are exploiting some uh, local Linux root application, you know, something that was like doing some sort of service or process. Instead of it doing its normal functionality, it would spawn us a shell, and we could use that shell to have root privileges. So we're going to be developing something like that. So to get you guys started, I. Yeah. You're going to be turning this into shellcode via the same process that I showed you with the Hello World shellcode. Um, and I'm actually going to simplify this for you a little bit more, just to make your life easier. Um, but I recommend that you, you know, I'll modify the starting file a little bit for you guys. And I recommend you flip back over the Hello World shellcode slides and see how I did that. And then, um, you know, sort of apply the same process and same transformations to uh, to this starting assembly source code file. So um, before I turn you guys this on that though, I'm going to actually simplify this uh, this starting file. And what I'm going to do is basically just change this this second argument, which is really a um, array of pointers, to null. Because it turns out that if you just do exec the slash bin sus sh with two with the other parameters as null, it'll still work. So you don't have to do all this other foolishness, because that part is actually kind of hard. Um, if you feel super brave, your feel, you know, you can certainly try to transform that um, into shell code, but I recommend you just try the easier one first, because it still works perfectly fine. So I will put up on the screen. Um, what to do there is you can find all the source code in the shell underscore shell code directory.
So I recommend that you just go ahead and make that change to your file. Um, if you want, you can make a backup of the original file. If you want to try something harder and turn the original one into shell code, but feel free to just use uh, There's some obvious issues you'll face with this. Um, are you know null bytes? Pointer to a string here. That's going to be a, come out to be an absolute address. You'll have to deal with that. There's some other mystery issues that I'm not going to tell you about because I want you to discover them on your own. Um, so yeah, once you turn that into shell code, if you want, if you're feeling really brave too, and you get this done really quickly, you're welcome to try to convert this into like a Perl script, like with Hello World shell code, and then use it to exploit the uh, simple login program. But I'm not going to ask you guys to do that as part of the lab. Step by I'm just going to try to do that. Um, you will be using your shell code on another program, but not simple login. I haven't shown you the other program. So if you finish your shell code before lunch is over, go ahead and start trying to attack simple login with this. Is there a way to debug assembly code and use GDB on it? Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. If you just use GDB and um, <coughs> do I need to compile it, uh, the ASM with a certain flag? Yeah, you might have to use it. I think it's like a G flag or something. Like it's so good. Yeah, just dash G. Okay. On the NASM command? Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't understand that command. There's already a dash F and an ELF, whatever that is. So it find it on the man page. So it'd be like this. Uh, put the G first. Yeah, the, the ELF is just like uh, telling it to use the ELF format. Okay. You got it, thanks. Answer your question. It could be something like this. Um, and I have done this before, so I have to it. Syntax for it all. So you put your shell code in something like this. So basically, that was. Uh, be moaning, having to like, you know, create the Perl script containing all your opcode bytes, which I agree can be tedious. Um, so if you create your shellcode in a separate file, you know, like this, and put some global labels in there, like shellcode start, shellcode end, which is the same as my shellcode, and then make a C file like this. You could obviously, you know, make it print out, you know, your slash characters and all that as well. Just set to create a Perl script. And then just do a while with, you know, pointers, shell code start, shell code in, just interpret them as bytes, just print out the hexadecimal bytes. And then to uh, link it all together, you would first compile. But um, for most of you, I want you to just do this by hand. Um, yeah, to get that extra character building experience in. But if you, you're certainly welcome to do something like that. Sure you as well. Literally character building, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> So I'm curious, what are some um, unique problems that people have run into when developing um, the Hello or the uh, the shell slash bin slash the shell code? Are there anything that you ran into with this that I didn't really talk about with the uh, Hello World shell code? So one issue is that your uh, slash bin slash sh string has to be null terminated. Okay. How are you guys dealing with that so far? 
So one of the real annoying things about this lab is trying to get that slash bin slash sh string into the stack and have it all ordered correctly and all terminated. Does everyone agree? Yep. yep. Do people want to see an alternative way to deal with that situation? All right. Um, if you want to keep using the stack method, I encourage you to do so, but I will show you another alternative that has its own drawbacks that you could potentially use for developing the shell code. No, I did not. Do you want to think about that for a while? See what horrendous abuse of x86 Corey is using to accomplish the goal. Push on to the stack when I do this call. The return address, right? Yeah. And at this point, the return address points to this. These bytes that I just told the assembler to he did. But I never return back to this code. Because I call and I just pop the return address off the stack into my register. <coughs> EDX is supposed to point to the pointer to the string. Then I null terminate the string by taking the address of the string plus 7, plus 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, plus 5, plus 6, plus 7, I just put a placeholder value there and turn it Move CL, ECX is all 0, I XOR ECX out, so move null byte right there, EBX is terminated. <coughs> Thank you. 
There is a drawback to this method. If I was to compile this and run it with NASM and LD, it would crash. If I was to run it as shell code in our payload, it would work. Does anyone know why? Think of all that's happening with this line right here. All of this code ends up in a text segment of the program. And what this line is essentially doing would be saying, modify your text segment with a null button. If you try to modify your own code as it's running, you're going to cause a segmentation fault that your code is marked read only generally when your program is executed. So this is trying to modify read only memory with um, an old byte when it's trying to you know, overrate the string, and that's going to call a segmentation fault. Why would this work if you used it in an exploit, in a payload? You don't know, have any idea. Where would this be located, be running, if we use it in a payload, if we use it to exploit something like simple logic? Be on the stack, right? Okay, it was on the stack. And the stack is writable. So this works nicely, except it's a little bit more of a pain to test out. So if you want to use this method, feel free. I'll leave the code up here. If you want to use the stack method, that's fine too. Um, either method is valid, and um, either way you think you will run into some issues later on down the road if you're trying to use the payload. Hey, Corey. Yes. Um, when you move um, like ESP into EBX or ECX or whatever, um, are you just move? How much are you moving? Are you moving the 32 uh, bits that ESP is pointing to? I mean, how much gets carried over when you move ESP over? The value the ESP is pointing to, I should say. Depends how you're doing it. Um, so if you were to do something like move EBX ESP, yep. this puts the 32-bit address that you know ESP is pointing at in the EBX. So four bytes are being moved, OK? Okay. So let's say that ESP let's say that ESP points to that. Okay? Okay. At this point, if we did that, EBX equals OXBF If we were to do move EBX ESP we can say yeah so that would set EBX equal to all right yeah if you were to do Say you're trying to null terminate your string or something like that. Yeah. Let's say <coughs> if we were to do that. That's just moving a single byte because we just specified the, the one byte register, the lowest byte of ECX. So in this case, assuming ESP, you know, the value of the data in ESP is that, we would get something like um, I said. Actually a little bit different because of a little E in this, but um, don't worry about it enough.
I think what you can do, I know this works with the Y ASM and maybe with the NetWide assembler, is if you want to move a single byte, uh, like explicitly do a single byte, you could do like move EBX byte. And it would just grab the first uh, byte that f of the value that ESP was pointing to. Yes, and uh, alternatively, I'm not positive about this, but I think you could also do, if you did like BL, the lowest byte of EBX, the assembler would be smart enough to know you're just talking about moving a one byte value as well. Now, yeah. It's because it should be, yeah, that's my mistake. I mean, just do it like that. What I was trying to do is I should have put it like that. It's just to signify there should be no light there. You really don't have to have it there. It just, you know, makes things a little bit more square. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know, I was just doing to make it you know. So it's like harness and do it like this, okay? So, for instance, if I wanted to use the, uh, the Hello World shell code, okay, and these are just the, that's just the contents of you know those are just the objects in the shell code outputted by the Perl script I made or whatever. Make sure you compile the shell code harness with TCC, by the way, not GCC, otherwise it will not work. So Corey, yes. Um, so in the in the previous example we went over before this, um, when we we uh, we moved ESP over to one of the registers, I guess that was because um, the system call expects to see a pointer to the string it, it exp in that uh, register. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, what I'm still trying to figure out is how does it know where it starts reading from that point or how far does it know to go? Is it is it null terminated? Does it keep reading until it hits a null? Until it hits a null, exactly. So what that means is that your slash bin slash sh string has to be null terminated. Y yeah, I would think so. Um, yes. Now, for the other, the other two things, because you made it simpler on us, um, we just have to pass nulls into those other registers. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, that's that's so. If we XOR with itself, does that that creates a null, right? It does. Okay. 